During this lecture, students are going to be able to learn to distinguish between accuracy and precision in terms of data um, and measurement uh, compilations. You're also going to be able to record measurements using the correct number of significant figures that are dictated by the instrument's precision. Um, and lastly, you guys will be able to calculate percent error um, when given laboratory and referenced materials. So accuracy and precision are uh, two words that we actually use interchangeably in our everyday colloquial language. However, they actually have two very different meanings when it comes to data and measurements um, in science and engineering. So accuracy is how close a measurement is to a correct or accepted value. So what we mean by that is, you know, if you describe uh, somebody as being six feet tall and they're really only five foot two, people are going to look at you and be like, how could you get that wrong, right? You are so far from an accurate description of a person um, that, you know, people would look at you funny. So accuracy is how close you are to that correct or accepted value. So somebody who is six feet tall, if you said they were, you know, 5'11 or 6'1, you'd be pretty close. And so your accuracy in terms of your description would be pretty spot on. Now, precision is referring to how close a series of measurements are to one another. And precision will also indicate the number of places to the right of a decimal um, that a piece of measuring equipment will give you. Um, so basically, a, a very precise piece of equipment um, will give you lots of digits. And we'll talk about examples there. Um, but just to kind of reiterate uh, the difference between precision and accuracy, uh, if we go ahead and use this um, dartboard example here, uh, as you can notice, or as you notice here, um, basically, you know, bullseyes are the target or the um, intended target generally in a game of darts. Okay, so in this situation, the four darts have hit the bullseye. Um, so they uh, are considered highly accurately placed darts. Um, and at the same time, the darts are very close to one another. So there is a high order of precision um, in this particular um, game board. Now, if we come over here to this example, notice um, we're pretty far away from the intended target, which would be the bullseye. Um, so we're not very accurate, um, but if we look at the location of the darts um, relative to one another, we would say there is relatively high precision. Um, and so basically your accuracy and your precision, um, you wanna make sure that you step, take a step back and um, kind of remove the interchangeable um, use of these two words um, as you proceed uh, through chemistry and your other science courses. So let's go ahead and let's look at some numbers, some data um, to kind of apply and discuss accuracy and precision. Um, and so if we go ahead and we look at these um, data sets, so this first data set here, notice we have measurement one, measurement two, measurement three. Um, and they are all different by, you know, a few hundredths of a centimeter. Um, and so we would say that the data here is very precise because each one of the measurements is close to one another. Now, the accepted value, um, or the quote-unquote correct value, is 8.77 centimeters. So if we look at this value, the correct value, versus the data collected, we can see that there's a pretty large difference, approximately 17 to 20-ish percent. Um, so we would say that although this data is precise, it is not very accurate because those numbers are not close to the accepted value. Okay. Now, if we look at the second data set um, series here, we have uh, data point one, data two, data point three. Okay. And if we go ahead and we look at the um, points relative to one another, we see that they are very precise. Um, and if we compare them to um, the accepted value, they are also very close. So this data is actually both precise and accurate. Now that we've looked at a few data sets, um, let's go ahead and let's actually discuss this from a uh, more quantitative approach. So the equation that we have written here is the calculation for our percent error. Percent error is basically how far off from the correct value your measurements actually are. So um, this is actually going to tell you um, how accurate uh, your measurement is. Okay, and uh, so what we have here is basically um, we have the absolute value of our experimental minus our theoretical value 
all divided by our theoretical value, okay? Um, and so experimental, this is what you're going to get in lab. This is what you're actually measuring. Um, and the theoretical is the correct value. Um, and normally I will give you um, this uh, information or you will obtain it from, you know, a CRC handbook or some sort of um, standardized uh, data set. Um, so basically you need to know this equation, you need to be able to write it out, um, and you need to be able to um, utilize it. Now, something else I want to point out here, guys, um, a lot of people forget to multiply by 100 when they're doing these calculations. It is a percentage that you're obtaining. Um, so you need to show all this work and show your multiplication by 100 um, in order for me to be um, able to give you guys full points. So please make sure you take the time to get the whole equation down pat. Okay, um, now let's go ahead and let's apply um, this uh, equation to the problem that we have down here. Okay, and they're, they're asking us, what is the percent error for a mass measurement of 17.7 grams, given that the correct value is 21.2 grams? Okay, so the first thing we want to do, guys, is we want to identify what's our experimental and what's our theoretical. Okay, so our um, correct value, uh, they have indicated here, um, is our theoretical value. Um, and our experimental value, the value that we measured, right, is the 17.7 grams, okay? And then what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to set up our work in our equation. Um, in chemistry class, you will not get points for just doing uh, the math in your calculator or in your head. You must show and set up all your work. Um, and that will benefit you in terms of points. So make sure that you're following uh, the protocol that I'm showing you here. Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and set up our percent error. Okay, our percent error is going to be equal to the absolute value of our experimental value, which is 17.7, minus our theoretical value, which is 21.2, okay, absolute value. And then we're going to divide by our 21.2, which is our theoretical value again, all multiplied by 100. Okay, now we're going to plug this into our calculator, and that's going to give us 16.5% um, error. Now, we're going to talk about something called um, significant figures and basically how significant figures are managed during calculations. So we'll come back um, to this equation uh, after next lecture and add a few things. Um, but basically, uh, we've established that, you know, we have a pretty high percentage of error. So our, our data measurement here isn't very good. Um, uh, there is quite a bit of error, uh, so it's not very accurate. Um, some of you may be wondering how I got a positive number. Remember, we have the absolute value sign here, okay? So the smaller number uh, being subtracted uh, by a larger number, of course, is going to give a negative value, but you take the absolute value of that and you get this positive number. Now, some of you be, may be wondering why we aren't accounting for that. Um, in this course, I'm not going to force you to try to reason if your measurements are too high or too low. That's what the plus and minus would help you uh, indicate. Um, so we're just going to kind of simplify it for you. So this is how you approach these problems. Um, notice my setup, uh, my work that I'm showing, my final answer. Okay, um, make sure you're following uh, the steps in the protocol. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, the significant figures. Okay, and significant figures we're going to be talking about for a couple of class periods. Um, but this is something that's not going to go away, so we need to make sure that we're very comfortable with it. So basically, significant figures, guys, are established um, by the piece of equipment that you're using. Um, and basically, significant figures uh, are all the digits that you know with certainty plus a, an additional final digit that is somewhat uncertain. Um, and this last uncertain digit is dictated by your estimation. Um, and so obviously your estimation might be slightly different than my estimation or by you know, your lab partners. Um, so there's a degree of uncertainty um, in that last digit. So, you know, when we ask, you know, the last digit is significant, but not necessarily certain. The reason why is because there's some variability because, you know, we're all human beings and have our own uh, set of eyes. Now, uh, the number of significant figures that you have is going to help you dictate the precision of your measured values. Okay, the more significant figures, the more digits you have, usually the more precisely you know um, your measurement. Um, now, Another way to look at this is that basically the more digits to the right of the decimal, the more precise the piece of equipment. Okay, and we'll be looking at various uh, types of equipment uh, as you guys move on to your activity. Um, so you'll be able to kind of get a feel for uh, why uh, precision is being looked at um, 
based on specific pieces of equipment. Okay, now what we're going to do now is actually look at our first measurement. Now our first measurement here is obviously a length measurement. Um, centimeters is what we're going to be using here. Uh, we use the metric system in uh, science, um, in chemistry specifically. Uh, so any lengths or masses or volumes, they will all be in metric units. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Okay, so um, how are we going to use or determine um, our measurements? Now, we've all used a ruler before, uh, but we need to make sure that we are um, using them correctly. So the first thing we're going to do anytime you have a piece of equipment is you want to look at the markings that are on that piece of equipment. Okay, and you want to start with the big markings. So if we look at you know, from one to two. Notice we're going from one to two, so we're increasing by a value of one. And then what we do is we look at the smaller marks. If we go ahead and we count up the marks in between the one and the two, we see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10. Okay, so each one of these smaller marks represents point one. Okay, so we are then going to take a look at using this piece of equipment to measure um, the uh, Paper clip here. Okay, so what we do there is we first look at um, basically the largest mark, the last largest mark before the end of the paper clip. Obviously, we know we um, butt up the piece to the zero marker. Okay, um, we have zero, we have one, we have two. Okay, the two is the last largest mark that we see, right? So we know that this paper clip is at least two centimeters um, long. And we know that with certainty because that mark right there tells us. We all agree that it's at least two centimeters. Then what we do is we continue over and we look at the smaller marks, okay? So 2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Everybody agrees that that paper clip extends beyond that 0.3. So we know we have at least 2.3 centimeters with certainty. Okay, now if you notice this paper clip actually stops in terms of its length between 0.3 and 0.4 okay so the paper clip is not 2.4 centimeters but it's also not just 2.3 centimeters and this is where your estimated digit comes in this is where the uncertain digit comes in because some of you may say that this paper clip is 2.37 centimeters some of you may say it's 2.39 or 2.38 depending on how your eye sees it so um, the measurements here are obviously going to have certainty when it comes to the digits that are coming from the actual marks. And then there's going to be that uncertain area right here. And that's going to depend on how your eye sees the measurement. Okay, But everybody does the best that they can. Um, and as long as your estimations are close, it, it works out really well. So make sure that whenever you're using a piece of equipment, you look at the markings right? You determine the large markings, you determine what the smaller markings represent, you express those marks relative to your measurement, and then you're always going to have an additional estimated digit. Now, some people will ask, well, what if it was right on the, the point three here? Well, in that case, you still need to indicate that digit, and you do that by showing that that estimated digit is actually zero. So what you would indicate is that you have 2.30 centimeters as your measurement for that piece of equipment. Okay, so um, this is how you progress with using uh, a ruler. Um, we're going to look at a couple of different uh, instruments to measure with. Okay, the next thing we're looking at here is a triple beam balance. Like, luckily for you guys, most of our labs are going to be using a digital scale that just has a straight up readout. Um, and you just record whatever's on the scale. But we do need to get familiar with a triple beam balance and how to read them. So if we go ahead and we look at the triple beam balance here, your triple beam balance um, is going to have the weighing pan and it's going to have counterweights. Okay, and so before we start and add anything to the weighing pan, what we're going to do is make sure that we zero the scale. Okay, and so the markers here, the little white mark here and the white mark there, they should uh, uh, basically butt up against each other. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to place your object on the scale. You're then going to see movement of this uh, marker here away from the zero. So then what you're going to do is you're going to counterbalance that weight that's on the scale with uh, the individual weights that you have here. So we have a larger weight, we have the medium weight in the back, and then the smaller one here. Okay, and you're going to move them um, to their appropriate notches. Okay, and if we look at this blow up up here, okay, notice the counterweights, there's like these little notches. You have to move them onto the little notches. Okay, um, so you'll move them 
And let's say that this is the measurement we got from the item that we placed on the scale. Okay, so what we then do is we basically add up and put together all of the pieces that we have um, from the counterweights. Okay. So what we have here, first and foremost, obviously, is our 60. So we know that the object that's on the scale is at least 60 grams. Okay, um, nothing from the larger uh, uh, row here. Notice it's in 100 gram increments. So our, our item is obviously uh, lighter than 100 grams. Okay, um, and then what we do is we have to take um, and combine the mass we got from the medium size weight and what we see from the reading here. Okay, now notice there's more markings here on this portion of the equipment. Um, so we need to establish what each of the marks mean. Once again, we look at the big mark, two to three. Okay, um, we count up the number of marks in between. Okay, so each one of these is going to be worth 0.1. So we know that um, we're going to have certain digits um, uh, in the tenths place. And then, of course, we're going to have to estimate beyond that. Okay, so if we go ahead and we look at our measurement here, right, um, we all agree that we are past the three marker here, right? Okay, so we know that we have at least 63 grams. Okay, so 63, right? But, of course, we have more marks, so 63 point. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at our marks. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 right? 0.7. I feel like it's right on the 0.7 there. So I'm going to say 63.7, right? And the mark is telling you that. So that's a certain digit. But remember, we also have to estimate. And since I think it's right on the 0 .7, uh, 0 0.7 marker, my estimated digit is going to be zero. If it was a little bit past it, obviously, I would need to indicate how far past it I think it is. Okay, so this is going to be 63.7 gram, uh, sorry, 63.70 grams. Okay, and that's the mass of the object that I placed on that scale. Okay, so far we've been looking at the measurement of solids um, using scales and obviously uh, uh, using rulers and things of that sort. Um, but now we need to talk about the special conditions associated with the measurement of liquids. Now, the measurement of liquids is going to be um, a little different. Why? Because uh, the chemical properties of um, water and other liquids uh, cause them to form um, basically curves, uh, usually in, um, you know, glassware or plasticware. Um, and this curve that you see at the top of liquids um, is known as the meniscus. Now, because of this curve, it creates, you know, maybe a discrepancy between, hey, where should I measure? Um, should I measure from the top of these lines here or somewhere else? Um, and so what we do is we've established that when we want to measure liquids, we need to measure from the bottom of that curve, from the bottom of the meniscus, okay? So um, what you would need to do is you'd place the container, if it's a graduated cylinder or what have you, you're going to place that on um, a, a steady surface. Uh, you're then going to get down to eye level, okay, um, so that you can see the bottom of the meniscus and you're going to place your measurement, okay? So if we went ahead and looked at this piece of equipment, um, once again, so this is a graduated cylinder, um, and so what we're going to do, of course, is we're going to look at the two big marks, right, and establish what they represent, okay, so this is 30 to uh, 40, okay, um, so obviously that's a bigger uh, range um, than we've seen in some of the other measurements we've done today, okay, so um, we're going to count up the marks, right, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right, okay, so each one of those marks is going to equal 1. Why? Because we're going from 30 to 40. This is not from um, 30 to 31. It's from 30 to 40. So there's a difference of 10 between those. So each one of these smaller marks represents 1. Okay. So if we look at this, we know we have at least 30. Okay. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. So I would say it's at least 36 milliliters. But then we also need to express um, the uncertain estimated digit, right? Okay, and notice we're between the 36 and the 37. I think we're at probably 36.6 milliliters, but remember the uncertainty in that digit is going to be dictated by the person measuring it. So obviously you might see it as 36.5 or 36.7, whatever that may be. But basically, um, this is how we would um, determine 
um, our measurement of this liquid. Okay, now if we come over here and look at this other example, um, you guys should immediately notice, um, first of all, the direction of the numbers. Okay, so this piece of equipment is actually a burette, and burettes uh, deliver liquids in a little bit different manner. Um, you fill up a burette, you take an initial volume measurement off of it, you pour out or, or um, uh, distribute some of the liquid, um, and then you measure a final measurement, okay? And then that new liquid um, measurement, the difference between the final and the initial is going to tell you how much you uh, released in the container below, okay? And so um, in this case, when we're looking at the burette measurement, we're going this direction, okay? Um, so just like with the previous uh, pieces of equipment, you want to establish the markings and what they represent. Okay, um, and so we have 24 here and 25. If we count it up, we have 1, 2, um, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? Okay, so each one is going to be worth uh, 0.1. Okay, now, but since we're going this direction in terms of our measurement, um, this is going to be the first marker. So we know that um, it's at least 24 milliliters, right? So 24 Okay, now there are additional marks, right? So we know that each one of the smaller marks represents 0.1, so we're gonna know that with some precision. Okay, so if we look at that, we know that we are um, below the 24 mark because the bottom of our meniscus is obviously below that mark there. Um, and the question now uh, becomes how much lower? So we have 24 milliliters, 24.1 um, would be right here, 24.2 would be there. Okay, but notice that the bottom of the meniscus I personally uh, think that the bottom of the meniscus is just slightly above the 0.2. Um, so I'm going to say 24.1, okay? And then my estimation is the 9, right? Um, so I think there's 24.19 milliliters um, as my measurement here, okay? Um, so if we were to compare these two pieces of equipment and the um, degree of precision uh, with which uh, the uh, instrument provides to our measurements, we would say that this instrument is more precise than this one. Why? This one has more places to the right of the decimal, um, so I know um, my measurements more precisely than with this piece of equipment. Okay, so this is measuring with liquids, okay, and this is measurement in general, so you guys should be pretty comfortable.